Good morning. Uh, through the modern technology of Skyping and everything, we are, we've been connected with all of our services throughout the day. And we've been peeking in on the services, and some services we've been talking back and forth. It's just kind of a day where uh, we are more than a little bit symbolically bringing us together. We are one congregation, and so uh, we're able to, this is one way that's helping us to see we're all together. So uh, right now I think we're first going to peek into the 11 o'clock worship service. And let's see as it comes up on the, there, can you see Jeremy there? He's preaching. He's, he's whipping them into an absolute frenzy right now. <laughs> see there, you, he's got his coat on. I can't see if he's got the tie on. He's already. He's got the tie. He's got the tie. <laughs> yeah, he's got the tie on. Yeah, good, good for Jeremy. He's, he's already got the traditional garb on anyway. There he is. A good shot there. Now we're going to take you to St. Mark so that we can see what they're uh, doing there. <laughs> Okay, we can see them clap. Oh, there you go. We, can't, we can see the congregation a little bit. They're just clapping. So they are just starting at 11.30. They're just beginning at 11.30 worship service to, to 12.30. So uh, we've been talking with Bryce uh, throughout the, the uh, morning and talking with him. They're very, very excited up there and all that's going on. So just want you to be able to peek in and, uh, and see what's going on in the two worship services. And um, if anybody comes out and tilts that around like that. They're peeking in on us at their designated time. So pay no attention to the man behind the curtain uh, when he comes out. We'll just keep on going like we're going. So thank you for uh, praying for me for uh, this past week and particularly on Wednesday when I had the opportunity to speak in chapel at uh, Asbury Theological Seminary. It's a seminary that I went to. And also, I don't know if you're aware about the impact that Asbury Theological Seminary has on this church. We have nine clergy employed in this church, and seven of those clergy graduated from Asbury Theological Seminary. So, I mean, the, the training that we receive there, what you receive from our teaching and our leadership and everything, it's just a, a, a school that, that believes in the Word of God and teaches the Word of God, and that makes a difference, I believe, in, in, uh, in what makes a church. So, anyway, got to speak to the students there and wanted to uh, hopefully make them laugh. Seminarians need to laugh. <laughs> and then, uh, I was going to be brutally honest with them from a personal point of view, and I was. Um, you know, it's one thing to see things from the outside, but it's another to see things from the inside and, uh, and not just the in, inner workings, but from the inside of my own heart and how I have experienced the, the ministry. And then I, I hope to be inspirational to them. So we'll let the jury decide whether that was the case or not. But we had a good time. I appreciate your prayers and to continue to pray for, uh, for Asbury Theological Seminary as they prepare pastors uh, for our churches. Uh, remind you, next week we start a new worship series on, on Joseph. And uh, let's see, what did we title that? That's messed up? Is it, is it, is it up? Does it say that's messed up? <laughs> I mean, you read about Joseph's family life. Every time you're reading, you say, that's messed up. <laughs> so, I mean, you may think you got some dysfunctions in your family, and we all do. But... Boy, he really had them in his family, and we're going to talk about surviving our dysfunctional families next week. Bad thing about dysfunction in our families, if you don't break that stuff, you pass it on. Did you know that? You pass it on. That becomes generational. And if you don't get healed of it, if you don't get help for it, if you don't recognize it and let God break that thing, you just pass it right on down the line. So uh, we're going to talk about some of those issues in, uh, in our dysfunctional families and how God can make a difference in all of that. If you're with us for the first time today, uh, this happens to be our, our commitment time is we uh, have a Beyond campaign where we're raising funds to uh, double the uh, children's building and enlarge our sanctuary at our St. Mark campus and to start a third campus. So uh, that's kind of what we're doing uh, today if you've walked in on the middle of us. So just relax. Don't worry about anything. We don't expect you to participate. Just enjoy the teaching and all the things. We also want to say hello to our Internet audience. You know, we have people all around the world, uh, people that uh, 
used to work here and uh, military people that go to other places and uh, they watch us and they tell us that they're watching us on the internet so we're glad to see you and say hi to the people that are uh, joining us by worship and by the way I worshiped with you last Sunday I heard Lisa preach uh, right here and heard Jeremy at 932 and Lisa so was, it was raining I didn't have a car I was in Wilmore I couldn't get out so I just pulled up my iPad and watched both worship services right here so it was really neat We've had an exciting time uh, over the last three or four weeks just talking about how God has raised our church up to have an impact. What he's done in the past to raise us where we are, the, the impact that we've had on our community, uh, not just our community, but our county, our country, and even, as the scripture would say, to the uttermost parts of the world. And it's exciting to see what God has done. But it's also equally exciting to see the, the opportunities now that He's given us for the future. I know this is just how I live my Christian life. I never believe that my best days are behind me. And I don't believe the best days of our church are behind us. I believe that our best days, just on principle, are ahead of us. And when if you're a Christian and you're on your dying bed, your best days are ahead of you. So don't ever forget that. No matter where you are in life, your best days are still ahead of you. But I really believe that about our church. I believe God has raised us up to have an impact. And we're just now to the place where we can leverage what God has done up until now. We're 100 years old, uh, but, but we aren't feeble. Uh, we're nimble. <laughs> and and he's, we can leverage what he's taught us and where he's brought us to to do things. So I want to just go back over some of the important principles that we've learned in the in the last few weeks, principles not, not for a campaign, but these are principles that are Christian, just foundational principles. No matter whether we were expanding or not, these are things that make a difference in your life. These are things that are biblical. These are things that, that uh, you cannot be what God wants you to be without these kinds of principles. You cannot be all that God would want you to be. Look, the first week, we talked about how God was looking for good soil to plant the seed of his word. You know, Jesus is a master storyteller and he would tell these stories about seeds and soil, but it's hard to illustrate spiritual truth. We try to think of some illustration to illustrate a spiritual truth, but Jesus was good at that. I mean, he was so good. I mean, how could you sit around and say, now how can I help them know what the heart is like? Oh, dirt. <laughs> That'll do it. Dirt. You know, he talked about there's hard dirt and there's dirt that's got rocks in it. And there's dirt that's got weeds in it. And there's dirt that, that's really good soil that the seed gets down in and, and, and has a crop. Everybody gets that. Everybody understands that. And what he's trying to say to us is that he wants our soil to be good soil. He says, some fell on good earth and produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. I just love that phrase. When, it, when that seed fell on that good soil, it produced a harvest beyond his wildest dreams. If, if I were to take a phrase and try to describe what has happened in this church over the last hundred years, I would say it has produced a harvest beyond our wildest dreams. I guarantee the 31 people that first started the Niceville Methodist Church had no idea we'd be here at this point in time. I mean, it was enough vision to, to plant a church. And that took a lot of vision. It takes, it takes a lot of vision to plant another campus. But to start a whole church from scratch, from nothing, is a very difficult thing to do. So those 31 people, they had a lot of vision. And they probably had played Sundays, too, to, to raise the funds and to do all that. They had to give sacrificially to make all that happen. But even so, they would have never had any idea that the staff in this church one day would be larger than their original 31. They'd never have any idea that this church would give millions and millions and millions of dollars to foreign missions, to ministries, in ministry to other people, transforming the lives of other people and what this would do. They never had any idea of that. In fact, Farrell Spence made a quote. He said, they had no idea that Niceville, the city of Niceville, would ever be as big as this church is. You know, it's just a little bitty town, fishing village and everything, but it's, it's grown over the years. Well, how, how did all that happen? Well, the NIV version of that same scripture says, the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. That's the key. 
who hears the word and understands it. See, all four soils heard the word, even the hard ground heard the word, but the birds came and got the seed before it could ever get down in it. So there's a difference in hearing the word and understanding the word. For those who get it, when you hear the word and it comes down in your heart and you get it, you just understand it, you comprehend it, and it takes root down into your heart and it yields a hundredfold, sixtyfold, or thirtyfivefold. I mean, so, so what kind of soil do you think God's looking for? He's looking for that good soil. He's looking for that soil that, that, that will thrive. In other words, he, he's, not, he's not expecting his churches to just survive. He's not expecting his seed to fall on hard soil and the birds to get it. He's not feeding the birds. He's, feeding, he's got another plan for the birds. This is his word that he intends to fall on good soil and thrive. 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. I mean, if I'm in a church and the church is not thriving, I look, let's call a prayer meeting and start and let's just look inward for a moment. Because we've got a God who's an almighty, powerful God. He wants everything to multiply and grow. Then why isn't it? Who, where's the variable in this factor? <laughs> I'd have to look at myself because I think God wants his word to thrive. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to be good soil. So, so that's our work today. Our work today is to do whatever is necessary to be good soil. Would you make that commitment with me? This has nothing to do with campaign. This, this has to do with next Sunday, next week, next year, next life, what, everything. Would you do would you commit with me? Commit to do. Say, I will do whatever it takes to be receptive to anything God says to me. Is that your commitment today? I'll do anything that God says to me. Whatever it is. Whatever it takes to be receptive to anything God says to me, I'll say it. I'll do it. That's, that, that's just what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to, to live for him and say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm everything. I'm, I'm everything. Everything I am, everything I have is yours. Then second thing we begin to learn was that we need to get out of our holes and give God a chance to act. Now, if you weren't here that Sunday, we used an obscure story in the Old Testament to illustrate this point. Jonathan and his armor bearer and the Philistine army greatly outnumbered the Israelite army. In fact, they didn't even have uh, weapons and stuff like that. And so they've all gone into caves. They've gone into holes. They've gone everywhere they, they can because of fear of everything. And I get, I get that a little bit. You know, when you look around in our world today, you look around in our country, it's kind of open season on Christians, isn't it? I mean, you can make fun of Christians all you want to, and that is perfectly fine. There is nobody coming to your defense. You can persecute Christians now all you want to. Free game. Nobody's going to come to your defense. So I can understand how it'd be tempting to go get in the caves and to go get in the holes and just us just withdraw and, and everything. You know, I don't want to take the arrows. But there was Jonathan. He looked out there, and there's those thousands of army. They're outnumbered, everything. And look, he says, he says, let's go over there. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. I mean, Jonathan says to his armor bearer, he said, let's go. Let's just go take the whole army on. I mean, God can do it, whether by few or by many. And this was going to be the few part, by the way. This was going to be the two now, that's one thing to believe that. It's another thing to act on it, isn't it? Do you believe God can save by few or many? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but to get out of your hole and go fight that army believing that is another matter, isn't it? He said, perhaps God will act in our behalf. That's kind of what we did when we first went to St. Mark. You know, we weren't all sure about what would happen and everything. Let's just go. Let's get going. Let's do this. Perhaps God will act on our behalf. And he did. It was great. 
I think sometimes part of what God's wanting to do, he's just waiting for somebody to trust him. I mean, there's Jonathan's armor. They got up, let's go over. Maybe God will work on our behalf. He's just looking for somebody to trust him, somebody to stick their necks out in this battle. You know, when the, when the Israelites went through the Red Sea, when it opened up, it weren't like they were all sitting in town and they looked over there and said, hey, guys, the Red Sea's parted. Let's go, go. we got a chance to get away right now. <laughs> now, they had to escape out. And it was when they got there that it parted. Or if you know your Old Testament history, when the walls of Jericho they, the Israelites were walking seven times around the walls of Jericho. That's about the stupidest thing you could do for an army. You know, and they had no idea. All they were going to have to do is shout all at the same time and blow a trumpet, and those walls would fall down. It wasn't like they were sitting over there saying, hey, look, the walls fell down. Let's go attack. They had to do something. They had to step out. It's just like the scripture reading that we had today about Peter in the, in the boat. They're all in the boat. Everybody didn't get out of the boat, but the only reason he got out, you know, Jesus called him and said, yeah, come if you want to. And he gets out of the boat. One of the things I think God is looking for us is to take a step of action. And guess what? God acts on our behalf. Every step of our way, God has led us. Every step of our way, he's acted on our behalf. He's blessed us. And there's no evidence that God's finished with us yet. There's no evidence that he's not going to continue acting on our behalf. But there does come a time for action. Today is one of those times of action. But I love this line. The Philistine said, look, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they're hiding in. I love that line. We Christians need to get out of our holes. It's time to get, look, they're getting out of their hole. They're coming, oh, we're going to get them. But I tell you what, the Lord sent a panic among that army that day. And those two began to rout the army. And everybody else came and joined in. You know, there's some early adopters. And there's middle adopters and there's late adopters. But the early adopters got out of their holes and they went first. And then everybody else followed and they won a great victory that day. I think God's asking us to take a step, to get out, to get involved, to take new territory. I mean, let's get out of our hole. Let's get out of our cave. Let's go take new territory. We look at the world out there and we think, okay, they're winning. Now let's go take some new territory. I love the story that Lisa tells about she's one of her responsibilities there at St. Mark is to oversee the Discover class. And she teaches a Discover class, like our Discover class, where you come and, and learn about the church and the gospels presented and all these things. And, and she said that after four and a half years of being there, every six weeks, they probably have about 20 to 30 people in this Discover class. And she says, literally every time, over half of those people will raise their hand to accept Jesus as their Savior. She said, I've seen more people come to the Lord in that worship service in the last four and a half years than I have in my entire 40, year, entire 40 years of ministry. I'm just telling you, that's remarkable. I'm just telling you, that's really remarkable. We're taking new territory. We're... Because we got out and moved out and took the church to the people and planning on taking the church, we're taking new territory. There are people who were not in the kingdom, who were in another kingdom before we went up there, who are now in God's kingdom because we were there. We're taking territory. And there's no doubt in my mind as we plan another uh, campus that we'll take even more territory for the kingdom of God. He just needs a people who believe enough and take enough faith to step out. And it's a great investment. Another thing, third thing, is that God's put us in a position of spiritual impact beyond St. Mark. I mean, Paul writes to his Corinthians and he says, as your faith goes, as your faith grows, we think that you'll help us carry out our assignment, spreading the good news in the regions far beyond you. I mean, we're here today because of Paul. We're here today. We're not the result of Jewish ministry. You know that, don't you? We're the result of Gentile ministry. We're the result because some congregation said, Paul, we believe in you. You're going to go who knows where on your boat to regions beyond, and we're going to help give to fund that so that you can go. And here we sit. 
because of that vision in that day. I tell you, you know, I say, we're the Ryan's Steakhouse of churches. You ever been to Ryan's? I mean, they got more to eat there. I, I'm telling you, you know, you, you go to the dessert bar first. And uh, I mean, there's more dessert than you could ever eat. And then you go to the salad bar, and there's more salad than you could ever. I mean, just whatever you want, all the steak and, and the, 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 you know, vegetables and everything. In the world. But, I, you know, I look around and I think, you know, some of, the, some of those people need to go home. I was like, you, you need to go to the house. Some people, all, you know, you, you can stay there. You can eat all you want as long as you want to. But, you know, when I think about our church being the Ryan Steakhouse of churches, it, it's not that, that, that this is a privilege for selfishly enjoying. It's a responsibility for us to share. It's a responsibility. We've had it good. We've had everything that there is to eat, spiritually speaking. I mean, if you want to serve somewhere, we've got a thousand places you can serve. You want to be served, we've got a thousand places to go and be ministered to. You know, you just, the, the level of everything, it's a privilege that God has blessed and favored this church with. We cannot just sit here and enjoy it ourselves and say, no, nope, not going to share my food with anybody. In fact, I believe I'll go back up for thirds now. <laughs> I mean, that's what God, that's just, that's just true. On how God put us in a place of impact. I mean, not every church has the spiritual maturity, the financial resources, the spiritually gifted leaders and volunteers, and a history of seeing God work in ways beyond their wildest dreams. That's us. That's why we have such a responsibility. I mean, Crestview is a place that's ripe for harvest. It's a city with a population of about 49,000 people, and it's continuing to grow. By 2017, there'll be additional 3,600 people are expected to move. I mean, just take that number right now. The people to move in, 3,600. That's the size of my hometown now. How many churches are in a town of 3,600? And we're just talking about one having another campus. How many churches would you need to, have, to reach 3,600 brand new people? I mean, part of what we know is there's approximately 65 churches in Crestview. But we figure that if everybody filled up those churches, no more than 12,000 could worship on an average Sunday. So you tell me what's 12,000 from 49,000. Would that be... Potentially, 37,000 people are not in church every Sunday. You remember something Jesus said? He said, the fields are white under the harvest, but there was one little bitty problem. Remember what that problem was? The laborers were few. He said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers. That's the problem. It's not that there are people that want to hear the message. It's not the people, if you'll go to them, they'll receive the message. It says, we don't have anybody to send. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that laborers will come forth. Then lastly, we learn, will you give God a chance to fill your empty jar? If you weren't here that Sunday, that was a story or this widow was having her creditor come, was going to take her children as slaves to pay for her debts. And she went to Elisha, and Elisha told her, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't just ask for a few. And she collected empty jars. Now, I would have told her to go get full jars. That certainly would have been a lot easier, wouldn't it? Can I borrow some oil? That would have been nice. But he said, no, you get empty jars. So you got empty jar. And God filled every empty jar that she had collected and would have filled more if she'd have had more, but she didn't. And the reason we chose that particular scripture, there were some things we wanted to say. One was to not to minimize your gift. It's so easy sometimes we think, oh, I have so little, or I don't have anything, or I don't have very much. 
Well, in the hands of, well, you know, in your hands, it's not very much, to be honest with you. But in God's hands, it's a couple of fish. It's a little few bread, loaves of bread. It's, it's two little copper coins. But in his hands, it's so much more. And we want to say, don't minimize your gift, but to give God a chance, to give him a chance to do something with what he leads you to give. And let me just say something in the middle of all that. You know, I hope that you have never felt pressured by me or the church in any of this. We've sought to educate and we have sought to inspire. I would never want to do anything that gilded you or pressured you to do anything. I hope that you do just what you feel the Lord is leading you to do. We've asked, the only thing we've ever asked is for you and the congregation to go before the Lord and say, Lord, what would you have me to do? And then whatever he leads you to do, you just do that. And if he says to you, I don't want you to give a penny. That's fine. That's between you and him. And if that's what he says to you, you obey him. But I hope you don't feel pressure from us. Our pressure is just to inspire. Our pressure is just to tell you and to show you the opportunities and what a privilege it is to be a part of it. And then you just get before the Lord and see what it is. God, God's going to bring about what he's going to bring about. God had a plan that she didn't realize that day. When she went and got all those empty jars, I'm sure she didn't know what in the world she was doing either. She didn't realize the level of her favor was going to be dependent on the amount of her faith. She had no idea that the oil that she was going to get would coincide with her obedience. She had no idea that the more vessels she collected, the volume of the oil would be all the more. God was going to fill every empty pot that she got in faith multiply. And so here we are today with our offerings, bringing our empty pots in. Lord, fill it. Lord, use it. He wants your family and my family to be a generous family in a world that teaches us to keep and take all that we can. He who has the most toys at the end wins according to the world. I've been around the deathbed of many people, and I don't think I've ever heard any one person ever say they wish they had more stuff when they died. I've seen a lot of them wish they'd spent more time with their family. <laughs> they wish they'd given their time to the Lord, wish they'd obeyed Him more, that they'd lived for Him more. I've seen that. He only wants us to use this time to grow our family. He's going to grow our family in the midst of this, and he's going to grow the kingdom. But I'll close on this. People will come to Christ because of your sacrifice. I can guarantee you that. People will come to Christ because of your investment. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, for the opportunity that we have to give to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to our message today. I hope that you've been inspired to act upon what you've just heard and become a doer of the Word. Feel free to contact us through the information on the screen or through our website. Better yet, if you're ever in the Niceville, Florida area, feel free to stop by and visit us at the Niceville United Methodist Church.